The Dawn Chorus, it's fantastic and it's one of nature's wonders that's enchanted us for centuries. However, the Dawn Chorus is far less rich and diverse than it was in our parents' and grandparents' day. We know from studies that sun thrush numbers are down by 58% and with Yellowhammer Skylark and House Sparrow suffering similar declines. And although some regions suffer more than others, local extinctions could lead to regional and even national extinctions. So how do we turn this around? The official view is that the decline in numbers has been caused by two main factors, that of habitat loss and degradation and the changes in modern farming methods. But it doesn't tell the whole story. For example, broadleaf woodland has increased by around a third since 1947. And in our agricultural systems, farmland hedgerows have increased by around 10% since the 1990s. In addition to this, around 73% of farmland in the UK is now part of agro-environmental schemes which help to promote biodiversity and enhance the landscape. These include methods such as beetle banks, conservation headlands, enhanced field margins, fallow land, and unharvested crop. This costs the taxpayer hundreds of millions of pounds each year, but is it money well spent? I met up with Dr. Christopher Bell to discuss the issue. All of the conservation effort so far that's gone into reversing the declines in the countryside has been based on the idea that it's agriculture and agriculture only that is causing the decline in birds. And it's all too easy just to, to concentrate on agriculture all the time because there are, there are so many different variables that you can look at. And also it's, it's, it's good for funding as well because you know, if you can pin biodiversity decline on the government, then you've hit the jackpot. You can go back to the government with your hand out and say, you know, you've got to give us money to you know, reverse this, this, all this damage that you've done through your policy. So, but all, you know, all the money that's been thrown at this so far just hasn't worked because the birds are still going now. And uh, so I think it's, you know, it's long overdue for a change of approach. So it appears that all our efforts have been focused on agriculture, but maybe we need to look into other factors as to why songbirds have declined. In our view, an important factor is being ignored, and that's the significant rise in the numbers of songbird predators, scavengers and competitors, which are estimated to eat around 200 million birds, fledglings and eggs each and every year. So the problem therefore is not only habitat loss and degradation and modern farming methods, but also the increased burden of predation and competition. In the past, we have wiped out all the apex predators and we used to act in the stead of those which we've done away with, the bear, the lynx, the wolf and the large eagles. Now we need to, to go back to acting in their stead, that's what we've forgotten. Um, so when you take away the top of the, of the apex of the pyramid then you get the rise of the middle level predators and more of middle level predators as opposed to a properly balanced system is more destructive. Sadly we do have to manage wildlife. So the number of cats, crows, magpies, jackdaws and sparrowhawks have all doubled and grey squirrels, badgers and ringneck parakeets have increased by tenfold. And who knows by how much the population of foxes, American mink, rats, stoats and weasels has increased during this period. Chris has found that there's a link between the increase in sparrowhawk numbers and the decline in the Royal House Sparrow. A few years ago I did a project with the British Trust for Ornithology and some people at the Cambridge University on the decline of the house sparrow and we were interested in whether sparrowhawks had anything to do with this because sparrowhawks had increased very rapidly over the same period that house sparrows had declined and I also noticed that urban house sparrows began to disappear around the same time that sparrowhawks began to move into urban areas in a big way which was around the, the turn of the 1990s. We looked at national census data, not really expecting to find anything because that had been done before, nothing had been found, no correlations had been found. But at this time we specifically looked at sites which had at least a 10 year run of data and where sparrowhawks had appeared part of the way through that run of years. And what we found was that sparrows were doing very nicely up to the point where sparrowhawks appeared and then they basically went off a cliff. Initially, we took these results back to the BTO and said, look, you know, we've got evidence here that sparrowhawks are affecting house sparrows. Maybe they're causing house sparrow decline. We really need to apply this methodology to all of the other birds that have declined in the countryside, things like starlings and bullfinches and skylarks and linnets and so forth. But the BTO said, 
we're not really interested in that. So I took the idea to Songbird Survival and they said yes we'll fund your project. So that's what we did and initially I looked at 20 species and I found evidence of a negative effect of sparrowhawk in 11 of those species and particularly strong evidence in starling, greenfinch and tree sparrow. And more recently I've looked at another 20 species and I found more evidence of sparrowhawk effects. And this time for some quite surprising species, things like lapwing and turtle dove and coltid. The increase in raptors is only part of the reason of songbird decline. And there's also the impact of corvids to consider. Dr. Madden from the University of Exeter is capturing and tagging corvids to gain a better understanding of this behaviour. I think the big difference that this study is having uh, from previous work is that it's trying to look at magpies and crows as individuals. So we're, if you like, testing the hypothesis that when we look at predation levels on songbird nests, particularly during the day, almost all of that predation is conducted by, by corvids. Um, of course, at night and at dusk, it's often mammalian predators that are doing it, rats and foxes and so on. But we accept that some individuals may be specialists. So uh, unless you remove or uh, deal with those particular individuals, you're not actually going to affect uh, the uh, predation rates on the songbirds themselves. So you might want to say that uh, whilst all nest predators are corvids, not all corvids are the nest predators. The project is being primarily run by my student Lucy Capstick and she's up in Warwickshire working on the site up there. What Lucy's doing is she's putting something called eye buttons which are temperature loggers into the nests and they record the temperature there and what that does is it indicates when uh, the female has left the nest. So if she's been predated or if the nest has been predated at night uh, you'll record a sudden drop in temperature at night time. If it's been predated during the day you'll uh, record the drop in temperature during the daytime and from that you can uh, suggest which predators uh, are responsible. So during the day it's corvids, during the night it's typically mammal, mammalian predators. She's also been collecting feathers from crows and magpies, both those that she's caught in the traps and also those from nests. Uh, when they've finished she's able to go up, climb up there and collect feathers from them. And what those feathers can tell us is something about the diet of the bird. And so by looking at the isotope level that's accumulated in the magpie feathers you can get an indication of how far up the food chain they're predating. And so by looking at the feathers you can get an indication of whether the bird has been feeding high up the trophic level, essentially likely predating um, songbirds, or it's been eating uh, at lower uh, trophic levels. And now for something a little bit closer to home. Hugh is a PhD candidate studying at the University of Reading and he's looking at a very familiar conservation effort, feeding birds in our back gardens. We put in all this time, money and effort every year in this country into feeding our birds in our gardens and fundamentally is it worth it? We spend something like 200 million pounds a year plus and that, that figure's at least eight years out of date so it's probably mostly more than that and it's we put in well, millions of hours or well, thousands of work hours and effort and that's something like 60 plus thousand tonnes of food. The first thing that comes to mind is well disease transmission We've got all these birds coming to this nat unnatural point. Most of us aren't particularly good at cleaning our bird feeders, so there's a lot more risk of disease transmission. But we're increasing the risk of local predation. So, literally, the sparrowhawk comes in and eats our birds. But we also have potentially negative effects on local bird breeding. So, magpies and squirrels use our bird feeders. They also eat eggs and chicks. So, basically, if we're encouraging them in and supporting their populations, we could be conceivably increasing the risk of nest predation in the local area and, in turn, decreasing our local bird breeding success. So, by, by feeding them, we could accidentally be having negative effects on, on our songbirds. Although some people say that the current increased level of predation is natural and that nature will find its own balance, they're forgetting that there hasn't been a natural, regulated environment in the UK for millennia. Mankind has killed off the majority of its top apex predators in the UK and we no longer act to maintain that natural balance between predator and prey. Years of sentimental TV and other social media coupled with heightened animal rights advocates means we see wildlife as being cuddly and we're far less able to tell people to control their pets, let alone control the overabundance of foxes and crows. This is a great shame as there is plenty of evidence to show that managing predator populations can lead to a significant increase in vulnerable prey species such as songbirds. 
but sadly this often gets ignored by the media. So it's down to us to highlight the existing evidence and deliver this meaningful data so that we can better inform the public and policymakers in terms of things like infrastructure and development. Songbird Survival supports and funds high quality research in how best to manage our wildlife. And by doing this we can get down to the root of the problems that are facing songbird declines.